everybody. Reporting to you again from the Glamour City, Hollywood. Natural climate solutions is a term which has emerged in the last several years to refer to ways that managing nature can help to deliver climate outcomes. And some of the, 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 the largest opportunities in the sort of the natural climate solutions opportunity set are exactly what you mentioned. Reforestation, so planting trees, we know that as trees grow, they sequester carbon out of the atmosphere and, and, and uh, to create the, the, their biomass, to create the wood and bark and the leaves uh, 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 that, 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 that compose their structure. Uh, or modifying uh, agricultural practices uh, to include cover crops or to reduce tillage of soil so that we can allow more organic matter to build up in soil. So natural climate solutions in a sense are uh, just a, a term of art that describes actions that either retain carbon in natural systems, so preventing deforestation, keeping the carbon that's in a forest in those trees, uh, or that increase carbon stocks in natural systems through planting trees or cover cropping or other means. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Mark Wishney, Head of Landscape Capital and Chief Sustainability Officer at Peak TG, Pactual Timberland Investment Group. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. So you're a prolific researcher. I know you've spent some time at the Smithsonian Institution, as well as at the Yale Tropical Resources Institute, in addition to advising Climate Smart Forest Economy Program of the Good Energies Foundation, uh, as well as to advising the Hoffman Center for Sustainable Resource Economy at the Chatham House. Um, in a very brief kind of a summary, how would you describe your areas of research? Uh, well, my focus historically has been on uh, forest restoration, uh, forest uh, reforestation with native tree species, and then uh, more recently also looking at the downstream impacts of the forest uh, product utilization. So when we harvest trees and we convert uh, wood fiber into products, uh, looking at the life cycle impacts of those products and linking that all the way back to the forest that we manage. Mm -hmm. Now, the process of, uh, you know, having a full full loop and having metrics and measurement, I, I got to imagine that's kind of hard to do. Uh, what are some ways that you've been able to gather data to be able to stitch that together? Well, uh, there are well-defined uh, processes for assessing life cycle impacts from industrial processes. And over the last several years in particular, we've developed uh, more robust techniques for assessing uh, carbon uh, and other impacts of forest management. The, the, the trick is connecting the two. So finding uh, means by which we can uh, uh, appropriately allocate the impact of a product utilization decision back to uh, the impact on the forest that may have been managed to produce that product. And that link actually requires not just sort of the engineering assessment of a life cycle assessment and not, uh, not just the sort of a carbon balance uh, analysis in a forest carbon assessment, but an economic analysis to attribute mm -hmm. actually changes in demand uh, and responding changes in material flows back to uh, forest management. And when you do these econo econometric uh, statistical models, uh, are you seeing fairly statistical significant variables that shows that, yes, you know, there is a correlation that can tie back and see the impact? Uh, yes, at, at this point, we can do that at fairly large scales uh, we, because there are so many factors that impact land management and decisions that individual landowners make uh, or uh, uh, forest managers make regarding forest management. Uh, it can be very difficult unless you actually can trace specific product flows from a forest all the way through the end use. It can be difficult to attribute a specific product uh, purchase decision back to an individual management decision on a forest, but at regional levels and at regional scales, we are able to start to attribute, for example, uh, uh, different uh, product uh, market developments to changes in forest management on landscapes. And, and that then allows us to begin to attribute uh, uh, the sort of the full life cycle impacts of product decisions uh, 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 all the way down to the, to the end user. 
And, and I think the regional aspect is going to be very important because uh, you were the founder and managing director of Equator and its Brazilian subsidy that was acquired by PTG Pactual in 2012. And now you're with PTG Pactual Timberland Investment Group and TIG, which is a subset, uh, has about $5.6 billion in AUM and oversees 3 million acres. But the parent entity, PTG uh, Pactual, uh, which is publicly traded, has about $132 billion in assets under management across fixed income, equities, hedge funds, timberland, uh, private equity, infrastructure, real estate. So really, at a very large perspective, you can start to understand how things flow and the impact uh, to get that full picture, correct? Yes, and I, I think what we've been seeing in sort of the international policy discussion around climate mm -hmm. and, and increasingly around biodiversity uh, is a, a, a sort of a, 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 a an increasing standard, a, a greater demand on the part of large financial institutions and, and businesses to more fully account for the impacts of business and of economic activity on climate and, and now increasingly on nature. And because some of the, so many of those impacts are diffuse uh, uh, and are really the product of sort of multiple drivers, uh, developing tools to be able to assess sort of regional and, and generalized trends becomes really important to be able to credibly account for some of those impacts. Agreed. Agreed. And, and you're really talking about carbon accounting and auditing as well. Um, so I think you alerted to this, but how does your organization manage down to the forest on the ground? Well, as a firm, we are both a, an investment manager uh, uh, and uh, through our subsidiaries, a forest operator. And, and so we actually have, uh, you know, an investment management teams and financial analysts and sort of all of the infrastructure uh, and capacity associated with uh, sort of almost any uh, institutionally managed uh, asset class. But we also, through subsidiaries, uh, employ foresters on the ground who stay close to the assets that we manage. When dealing with natural resources, when dealing with forests, one, one is managing large areas that are embedded in larger landscapes. And so being close to the assets under management, being part of, part of uh, the communities in which we're managing, uh, knowing our neighbors and being good neighbors, it actually becomes very fundamental to delivering not just investment returns, but to ensuring that we're delivering the, the sustainable outcomes that we're seeking. Really boots on the ground. And going a little bit tangent here, I know we've had guests on uh, this podcast that have been working in South America specifically, where historically some of the indigenous people would actually mow down or cut down these timbers or forests to create monocultures for agriculture purposes. But they're creating different incentives and different structures, and in some cases, even outright salaries uh, to nurture and watch these trees and be compensated for that instead of cutting it down and turning it into something else. Uh, I wonder what are some of the things that you're seeing as well as employing at the ground level? Yeah, well, we think it's really important that uh, as long-term managers, uh, it, it typically uh, investors in Timberland are, are typically seeking exposure to individual assets for 10 years, 20 years, or even in some cases uh, on a perpetual basis. And a long-term management of that kind really requires that one be a, a part of the community in which one is managing and that the community around you, that, that people living in those landscapes have a vested interest in, and, and are supportive of the, the long-term management of those assets. And so uh, providing opportunities or ensuring that, that uh, community interests are considered in, in, in project design before we even enter a, a, a new landscape is sort of a critical part of our diligence process. But on an ongoing basis, um, we, in a variety of different ways, seek to prioritize the development of local value chains. We, we, we seek to provide uh, direct and tangible economic opportunity to the communities that we work in. And that can range from uh, uh, em employing uh, local community members directly uh, on our, our assets uh, to helping to uh, 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 support um, uh, related businesses that may be community owned businesses, mm -hmm. but that are also similarly uh, deriving benefit from the assets, the forests that we're managing. So for example, uh, that might range from directly employing community members uh, uh, to help manage the assets that we have, uh, that, that we've acquired to, for example, uh, supporting local cooperatives uh, that collect uh, honey, uh, that maintain mm -hmm. beehives uh, across properties that, that we own, uh, but then provide access uh, uh, for honey production. So there are a number of ways uh, that really become locally specific to engage with local community members. Um, 
really depends on what local community needs are, what the mm-hmm. context of the landscape is that, that we're working in, uh, and, and what the opportunities are. And so this, again, is where the boots on the ground, as you, as you said, become really important because there's not a single approach right. uh, uh, that, that applies across, uh, you, you know, across our footprint, let alone across, a, uh, you know, a, a given state or even a given municipality where we may be investing. Correct. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And as a large entity that's managing millions and millions of acres, it's so critical to really cascade some of those uh, decision making and local local flavors down to the people that are closer to those communities. Let's Absolutely. talk about natural climate solutions or NCS. And I think these are referring to tree planting and cover cropping. Um, why are these important and how is this helping to solve some of the climate issues that we're having? Yeah, well, natural climate solutions, um, uh, 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 you know, in a, in a sense, these are very ancient technologies, if we were to think of them as technologies. Natural climate solutions is a term which has emerged in the last several years to refer to ways that managing nature can help to deliver climate outcomes. And some of the, 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 the largest opportunities in the, sort of the natural climate solutions opportunity set are exactly what you mentioned. Reforestation, so planting trees, we know that as trees grow, they sequester carbon out of the atmosphere and, and, and uh, to create the, the, their biomass, to create the wood and bark and the leaves uh, 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 that, 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 that compose their structure, uh, or modifying uh, agricultural practices uh, to include cover crops or to reduce tillage of soil so that we can allow more organic matter to build up in soil. These are, are uh, processes which, in fact, in a sense, have historically driven the accumulation of the fossil fuels that we're burning today. These are all, you know, oil and coal are essentially ancient deposits of, of, of plant material that have accumulated over time. So natural climate solutions, in a sense, are uh, just a, a term of art that describes actions that either retain carbon in natural systems, so preventing deforestation, keeping the carbon that's in a forest in those trees, uh, or that increase carbon stocks in natural systems through planting trees or cover cropping or other means. The reason that uh, this is, uh, the natural climate solutions are, are getting more attention today is really, I, I think, twofold. One is that in the last several years, a number of important studies have demonstrated that natural climate solutions have a much greater potential to help uh, mitigate climate change than was previously understood. So uh, one, uh, one important study published in 2017 established that at an economically efficient level, natural climate solutions could deliver about 30% of the mitigation needed to achieve the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that is a, a share that is greater than perhaps the transportation sector could deliver by 2030. So this is actually a very, very significant number. Um, the other reason that natural climate solutions have been really gaining uh, 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 sort of attention is that I think as we've realized that um, simply reducing emissions is not going to be sufficient, it's increasingly clear from all of the long-term climate models that we not we need to not just reduce emissions, but actually we need to actively remove carbon from the atmosphere. Natural climate solutions, tree planting, cover cropping, other means are the only large scale opportunity that is deployable today that we have to actively remove carbon from the atmosphere. There are a number of promising and interesting technological carbon capture uh, 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 technologies that are under development but none of them are yet deployed at a scale or at a cost that, that makes them meaningful uh, given the scale of the climate challenge. So the potential for natural climate solutions to deliver, to deliver carbon removals is uh, I, I think sort of a critical role that they can play over the, the coming decade. So being a little bit cynical as an investor, so you're saying that uh, sucking air and processing that in a factory to uh, reduce some of the CO2 isn't a scalable solution. Um, now, when I talk to farmers and I talk about sustainable agriculture, they will often say, well, we've always been doing this for generations. There's an ancient wisdom to what NCS is, but yet why is it difficult to have implementation across the board, across the different regions? And what are some of the challenges that crops up both regionally, but also locally? It's a, it's, it's a great question. And, and really, um, the strength and the weakness of, of NCS is in part that it is this, this ancient technology, right? There, there are, we have been managing landscapes and we have been growing crops and growing trees for um, thousands of years. Uh, and and that, is, that is a strength. 
the, the challenge uh, of NCS, there are a number of challenges, but one of the challenges is simply the scale at which change has to occur and the pace. So delivering on, on, on that 30% of the mitigation that natural climate solutions could potentially deliver requires that in the next several years, we change the management of hundreds of millions of, of acres of land, perhaps a billion acres or more of land in the next 10 years. That it would, would be a combination of reforestation, stopping global deforestation, modifying agricultural practices, um, accomplishing land use changes of that scale in that time period, uh, I'm not sure that there's a precedent in modern human history. And so the challenge of NCS is really, uh, uh, there are, uh, of course, there's more that we need to understand. There are new techniques that we can develop, but a lot of the challenge is really taking the techniques, the things that we know work and getting them to scale quickly enough to make a difference for climate. And, and some of that is um, not just simply ownership. In the case of PTG Pactual, of course, uh, Timberland, you guys have a huge area that you guys manage. But when you take it on a global aggregate perspective, there's many different players, some of which are corporate, but some of which are also smaller uh, or privately held as well, or even government or, or preserve, for instance. So uh, it becomes very her heterogeneous. So how do you start to get cooperation between countries and entities, both private and public, as well as, uh, you know, other NGOs that are working in this area. Yeah, exactly. It's incredibly heterogeneous. And, and although small landowners, by definition, individually, or small landholders, because in many places in the world, land ownership is unclear or unsettled, uh, the small landholders, by, by definition, control small areas, but in aggregate, they may control the majority of, of privately managed land in the world. So, so finding uh, uh, solutions requires really a wide variety of approaches. And, and what we have seen uh, in the last several years are uh, a, a global process uh, to align governments and develop government policies that will create the enabling conditions for, uh, 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 for greater climate mitigation on the ground. But in the last couple of years, we've seen, I, I think, two sort of promising developments that are, are new, at least in my experience. The first is, a much greater interest in recognition on the part of, of private investors, not just uh, of the role that they need to play in addressing climate change. We've seen you know, the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative together commit perhaps $60 trillion of investment portfolios to net zero uh, in the last 24 months. Um, but also a recognition that uh, those climate commitments need to include, uh, to an increasing degree, investments in natural climate solutions. And so certainly having significant uh, 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 private capital um, begin to actively seek opportunities to expose investment portfolios to climate positive NCS investments, that is a, a very promising development. And the second is that the carbon markets, although still very, very small, I, I believe that um, they quadrupled the, the voluntary carbon markets, I believe quadrupled last year in size to about 2 billion in total traded volume or traded value. That's a very small, a $2 billion sort of transaction mm -hmm. volume uh, for any globally traded, traded commodity is, is really a tiny number. But the increase in uh, the total value of offsets traded uh, and the uh, uh, development now of some market infrastructure to support more robust, more transparent, more fungible offset trading, I think that that also uh, will uh, create some new opportunities to directly finance uh, NCS on the ground for a variety of different landowners by creating an avenue for finance to flow to landowners or landholders. Um, however, there's a lot more work uh, that needs to be done. In our own business, we've also actively sought collaborations with some of the leading uh, environmental NGOs to help guide us and help advise us in, in our efforts to um, deliver on, on, on climate mitigation the potential of our, of our investments, but also to deliver on the, the, the biodiversity potential and to help us ensure that we're doing that in ways that are, are really equitable for the communities in the landscapes in which we're managing. I, I think that as we're finding new solutions, uh, uh, we need to recognize as private sector actors that there are other entities, whether they are governments or NGOs or, or community organizations or research institutions or others, that there's other expertise that we're going to need to bring to bear on, on that problem, on that challenge. So I think those kinds of collaborations will be an important part of, of the solution as well. 
Super. And I think you started to kind of allude to a little bit, but um, can you tell us about a couple of those areas that you just mentioned? What specifically is PTG Pactual Timberland doing to create some of these markets as well as to spur further investments? Well, we actively engage on the on the environmental market side. We actively engage in the emerging sort of global infrastructure around carbon and uh, accounting uh, and, and 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 nature and biodiversity sort of impact accounting uh, and 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 in the case of carbon uh, uh, offset trading. And, and what we're seeing is not just that an offset market is developing, but the rules that apply to financial institutions and corporations that define how how carbon footprints are calculated, how they're accounted for, and, and therefore what actions uh, can credibly be considered as as, mitig- as as mitigation for those, 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 those impacts. That entire rule set is being developed now as we speak. And we think that it's critically important that the private sector engage in that, uh, in that process, in that rule setting process, because that's largely uh, developed by multilateral organizations, by uh, civil society organizations, by research institutions. Uh, and we think that private sector engagement there is critical to make sure that we come up with a workable set of outcomes. And so uh, a lot of our work is, uh, or a lot of effort is dedicated to engaging actively in those rule making, rule setting processes. Um, we also think that a, a missing piece of the of the of the NCS opportunity is uh, ensuring that we focus not just on the land use changes that can drive this mitigation. We talked about reforestation or cover cropping, and you you asked about what would be some of the drivers that might help drive those changes at greater scales, given the heterogeneity heterogeneity of, of land ownership and and land management. We think it's really important that we focus not just on sort of the supply side, which is which is really what's happening on our landscapes, but also the demand side. So increasing demand for products that confer climate benefits. So we know that when we when we harvest trees in a sustainable fashion, when we replant after we harvest, and then when we use those products in climate positive applications. So for example, long live wood products, a wooden table, wooden furniture, wooden house, the carbon in that wood is stored for the period of time that that product is in use. So we can store carbon in materials for decades or or longer in many cases. And when we choose to purchase a wooden table, for example, rather than a a, a plastic and steel table or build a building out of wood rather than concrete, not only do we store carbon in that product, but we also avoid emissions associated with producing those more emissions intensive materials. So uh, for example, if concrete and steel were their own country, they would be the world's third largest emitter after the US and China. So when we reduce our, our, our consumption of concrete and steel, and shift that to a biomaterial like wood, we can have very significant uh, climate impacts. And the virtuous cycle is that as we build demand for climate positive products, that also increases financial flows or or market signals back to rural landscapes to produce those those materials, whether those are uh, 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 climate positive forest products or climate positive agricultural products or others. So we think that, that developing the end markets uh, and supporting um, uh, policies and accounting systems that recognize those end product impacts are also a critical piece of the puzzle. And I think some of this, uh, I think, is uh, mentioned in a Nature Communication article that was shared uh, with us previously, where it talked about some 90% of new urban population that are housed are built um, using these wind structures. And I guess, uh, but what is 106 gigatons of additional CO2 could be saved by 2100 if we were to move towards some of these more natural products and constructions, as an example. Uh, we are out of time. I have been joined by Mark Wishney, head of Landscape Capital and Chief Sustainability Officer at PTG Pactual Timberland Investment Group. Thanks for joining today. Thank you, Scott. Enjoyed it. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.